Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the Scottish Running Podcast with myself, Sean Gaffney. Um, Pete Tucker, he, he can't make it tonight, poor Pete, because I thought he was going to help his debut the, the Scottish Running Podcast t-shirts tonight as well, but maybe Pete will wear his next time. So today we've got a Mr Colin Thomas who runs for Bella Houston Harriers. Uh, however, I was searching on YouTube just for running videos like I usually do. And there is one company called Sweat Elite who do really, really good videos of like lots and lots of elite athletes training, uh, especially in Kenya as well. And I was watching a video with the current world record holder, Agnes Jebet, who is the world record holder for the 10K. And she broke that in Valencia. She ran 28.46, which was absolutely insane. But in that video, I noticed a Scottish accent, and it was Mr. Colin Thomas here, who is part of Agnes's team. And I uh, bumped into Colin at the sixth stage, and I said to him, hello, i seen you. <laughs> Would you like to come on the podcast? And happily, Colin has decided to come on today. So first of all, Colin, thank you for coming on. And first and nextly, how are you? I'm very good, Sean. Um, yeah, thanks for inviting me. On, so I'm quite quite excited to have a have a chat with you tonight. Yeah, yeah forward to it. Absolutely, absolutely. And it's it's just by chance, you know. I watched that video, then I seen you at sixty. I was like, I'm going to go and ask him if he if he fancies coming on. But yeah, it was it was strange how you don't really hear a Scottish accent in these videos and sweat late, and I seen that one, and then well, this guy is he's part of the team with Agnes Jebet, so really excited to chat to you about that. So. But first of all, before we go on to you, but that that world record Agnes ran that was incredible twenty eight forty six and the, the the main coach the guy called Julian he said that wasn't even their big target no that was just a stepping stone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she actually she she broke the world record before that actually somewhere in Romania, but the the course wasn't um the, the correct distance so it wasn't it wasn't ratified. But she actually, if the course was the correct distance, she would have broken the world record there. So <laughs> she went into that race in Valencia. You know, we were confident that that was going to happen. And yeah. Um, yeah, she pretty much blew it out of the water. And actually, during her 10K world record, she ran a 5K world record um, on the way to that, which is pretty crazy, pretty insane. And um, first female athlete to break the 29 minute barrier for 10K. So uh, yeah, awesome. And you saw in the video that. that Coach Julian um, was saying that it wasn't a main target; it was just a, a stepping stone. Um, the main target, obviously, being with this being an Olympic year, aiming for Paris Olympics. Yeah. Um, so yeah, fingers crossed for that. Should be an awesome year if everything goes according to plan. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, she will be the one. To, she will be the high, the high, high favorite going into Paris, and everyone will be on her. But what I'm thinking about, and even watching that session. I can't remember what the session was, but if you finish with a, a few 400s as well, but it's quite a high volume. And even still, she's hitting those 400s and, you know, low 60s. So even if the her next competitors try and out sprint her, they might not be able to. And they might not be able to outrun her during the race because she just looks like an absolute machine. So it'll be a good one to watch. This is quick. Yeah, the, the session had 10k volume pretty much and finishing with four four hundreds and yes yeah, sixty four and then going lower. So so she's she's nipping around a track to say the least. Um she always finishes a session with, with some strides as well. And if you see her just hitting down the hundred meter straight, she's yeah, she's quick. She can sprint, definitely, definitely. That'd be a really, really good one to good one to see. Uh, that's probably that's gonna be the, the race I'm gonna be looking at for the Olympics, second to the, the men's 1,500 metres to see if Josh Kerr. <laughs> of course, of course. Oh, it's going to be such a good Olympics, isn't it? There's so many big races and it's yeah. good to see the Scottish contingent doing so well as well. Like you say, the 1,500, and then the, you know, the, the women's 800 and, and then you, you, Ailish might well be in the same race as Agnes as well, which will be interesting. Yeah. So, Ah, it's it's, it's going to be it's going to be good. That that the women's ten thousand is, is going to be so competitive as well. See when you chuck in, like, you've got all the Kenyans and the Ethiopians, and you've got Sifan Hassan, who's who knows what she's going to do. I mean, she she can race any. She could race them all. She could do the fifteen hundred, the five, the ten, the marathon. Who knows? It's wild that Sifan Hassan, you know, 
at that when she was saying I'm going to do the 15, the 5 and the 10 I was like how's that even possible but she she very nearly pulled it off you know but it's, it's so demanding you know three it's three completely different training systems and, and you, you try to peek for every single one of them I don't know how she does it yeah insane plus she does a marathon these days as well she might just throw that into the mix I don't imagine that the the, the female version of Emilio Zatopic <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's not been done since then. But yeah, so uh, more importantly on yourself, so with the Agnes uh, Jubet video, so I'm just curious, so how did you kind of find yourself in that situation where you're kind of part of that team? Yeah, good question. Um, yeah, I sometimes kind of pinch myself a little bit. Um, I've been going out to Kenya since 2015. Um, and to be honest, I, I, I made it happen myself. I, I created my own pathway. Um yeah, back back in twenty fifteen, I just just booked a flight and and went for it. Um, the opportunity was kind of put in front of me. I, I'd always wanted to go to Kenya and see how these Kenyans train and stuff because I've got that fascination of sports scientist and physiologist by background. So I've always had that fascination since my student days. Um, and then so it was a guy called Miles Edwards. A lot of the listeners will know from Aberdeen. Mm-hmm. Miles does a lot out in Kenya. Um, and at the time he had a house there and, and we'd been chatting and I'd, I'd been saying about my, my desires to go to Kenya. And he, he gave me the opportunity. He said, look, my house is lying empty. Do you want to go out and, and stay there? So and that was the only invitation I needed. He didn't have to ask twice. Um, and I just booked my flights and headed out there. Um, and once you get to E10, it's it's a, it's a small town. It's, it's the home of champions. It's full of runners. It's full of running coaches and managers and, and, and all the rest of it. So... It's pretty easy to get to know people. Mm-hmm. And over the, the years since then, things kind of spiralled um, from working with various groups of athletes and setting up groups myself. And um, going back a few years, we've we've provided clothes and shoes and food, etc., cetera, for, for groups of athletes as well, some of which have done pretty well now and, and, and are kind of becoming household names. Um, and things just spiralled over the last few years. And a couple of years ago, um, I met met um Julian, who was the coach, um, in that video that, for Agnes, and he's also a manager. He he manages a quite a large contingent of of athletes. I think he said he's got thirty five athletes, um, in the doping pool, so kind of thirty five professional athletes, if you like. Um, so a uh, a kind of group of men and a group of females, um. And he asked me a couple of years ago if I would work with um, an athlete called Joanne Chalimo. Mm. So Joanne is the kind of, if you like, probably the kind of senior athlete in the females group. Mm-hmm. Um, she she has been as high as number three in the world. So some people will, will know the name. She ran, she's ran 65 minutes for the half marathon. Yeah. And 218 for the full marathon. Which is... <laughs> Yeah, so and two eighteen is you know rapid for a female. Plus that would have been when the world record was two fifteen or two fourteen. So, so not not a long way off the world record. Um, so yeah, Julian primarily asked me to work with with Joanne, um, and her group of athletes, um, and that kind of spiraled into um, working with the men's group as well. Um, and then obviously, um, this year was kind of Agnes making that breakthrough because she's she's been about as a, a a young athlete for for a few years and and kind of progressing, um, gradually. You know, our times have been getting quicker and quicker, year on year, and she's she's now kind of transitioned from that kind of junior athlete into into a senior athlete with a bit of a a bit of a boom, if you like. Yeah. Um, and it's it's a great group to work with, um, as well as Agnes and Joanne. There's a, a young Kenyan athlete who's got a really good backstory as well. So her name's Diana, um, Diana Cheritic. And she's an under-20 Kenyan athlete. She was fifth in the World Champs cross-country there, under-20s cross-country in Belgrade. Um, same race as, I think, Natasha Phillips was in that race as well, who you had on the show. Yeah, Natasha, she finished 30th, I'm sure. She was 30th, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Same race as Diana. Uh, so Diana finished fifth in that. So she's obviously a really promising, talented athlete. And the backstory behind Diana is that she she turned up at the training camp um, with a baby. And she had basically ran away from her husband in her home village because her husband was beating her up quite quite badly. Which, very sadly, is quite a common 
thing in Kenya. Um, it's still certainly in rural Kenya. It, it's still a place where the male is very much the dominant figure, and the female just has to kind of do what what they're told by the husband. And and Diana was was beaten quite badly by the husband, and I believe the husband's brothers. Um, and and couldn't take it anymore, and and picked up her baby, which she was she was probably forced to have because Diana is very young, and she picked up a baby and 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 ran for it, and kind of turned up at the training camp because she had heard of um as an organisation that that Joanne and some of the other athletes run called Tirrup's Angels, so that was set up um after Agnes Tirrup was murdered by her husband, so Agnes was the Agnes Tirrup was the previous women's ten k world record holder. And yeah, she got murdered by her, her husband. Some of the athletes kind of got together to set up Tirrips Angels, which is all about um, kind, kind of female empowerment or, or awareness and, and um, trying to kind of raise awareness that, um, you know, equality. Husbands are not there to, to beat up wives and, and all that kind of stuff. So um, Diana had heard about this and picked up a baby, ran away from her husband and turned up at the training camp and she's now developing into a really, really good athlete and probably going to be a world-class athlete. So keep an eye out for Diana Cheritich. She's, she's one to watch for the future and fingers crossed she's the next big name in running as well, as, along with Agnes. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that would be the one for us all to look at. It would be a great story if she gets to the Olympics and she wins a 5 or a 10k or a marathon. That would be a great story. Be brilliant. Be brilliant. Yeah, yeah. That's, yep. and that's that's why I, I I did I've read a few books on on Kenya running um at Harahan Finn who has experience and you know when you're younger they told oh the Kenyans run everywhere they, they run to school yeah. and this is and then I reading his book it was he mentions that you know the Kenyan kids run to school because there was a culture back then uh, yeah. when really really if the kids were late to school they get beat up by the teacher so yeah. that's why they ran so they weren't late. You know, so and then they would they would they would just run back home anyway because they need to go back and work on the farm before it got dark, etc. As well, so it yeah. wasn't that they 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 ran because oh if I do this I'm going to become a world athlete. It's because it was kind of out of fear of not getting beat up initially. Yeah. I know. Do you know what? It's a great theory, but see when you go to Kenya, you don't really see that in reality. It's like mm -hmm. there's there's schools everywhere. So, because there's there's that many kids, you know, yeah. there's big 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 families. There's no um, there's no family planning. So there's loads of kids. There's loads of schools. They don't they don't really run at all. Um, they're all out playing in the street because they don't have playstations, etc. It's nice it's nice weather, so they're out playing hopscotch and they're skipping and they're just th throwing about car tires and stuff, <laughs> uh, playing with whatever they can find. So they do get that kind of general um, healthy active upbringing. But it's not specifically in running. They, I, I don't really think you, you you don't really see many running that much until they're a little bit older. Mm -hmm. um, but it's it's funny though that they do sometimes just come and run along next to you. And even though if you feel like you're running quite quickly and you're out of breath, the Kenyan kids are just running along as if it's it's so easy. They're just <laughs> effortless. It's, it's so annoying, man. It's so annoying. <laughs> it's I do a lot of them running. Is it is it true that a lot of them do run in their bare feet as well? See the occasional one in bare feet. Um, I think more, perhaps ten or twenty years ago, possibly. So a lot of the athletes that are around now, possibly ran as barefoot children. Mm -hmm. You don't really see kids in barefoot these days. I think certainly around E ten. I think E ten is quite a. I was going to say thriving. It's not really thriving, but it's come on a long way. Certainly in the last eight or nine years. Um. You know, there's there's concrete roads now, there's streetlights now. Um there's yeah, it it's come on so much. There's lots of tourist shops actually along the town because there's now there's now so many non Kenyans that go and visit. Yeah. So the locals have almost kind of learned how to tap into that and and earn a living from it. Yeah. So really in and around E ten now there's not there's not really a reason for people not to have any shoes on. Yeah. Or be hungry or anything like that. There's there's opportunities for them now, which is good. Yeah. And especially I think I'm reading a good few articles as well, like, you know, maybe some runners who do blogs and they've went to Kenya and mm -hmm. they've maybe been out jogging. Like they're, they're not by any thing, no, they're not amazing runners, but they'll just be like, I'm gonna run this morning and Elio Kipchoge 
ran past me. Yeah, yeah. And then people go like, that, oh, like then more and more people go like, if I go over there, I could beat all, I could beat, <laughs> I could go and run with the best runners in the world. So I'd imagine yeah. that that brings in like, like a bit of a running tourism. People just go to Kenya to run and maybe bump into a world cup class person like Kipchoge as well. And and it's true, you, you bump into, you know, world champion athletes just constantly, constantly. Yeah, they, they have a saying in it, and it's something like, if you th- if you throw a stone, you're likely to hit a world champion. And it, and it pretty much is like that. You just, you know, you're, you're just out for lunch and you meet Faith Kip Yegon or something, you know, it's just, yeah, yeah they're just everywhere and they're so down to earth, they'll, they'll, they'll just sit and chat to you and... Um, it's such a, it's just a level playing field, I guess, isn't it? Uh, they're yeah. all, yeah. It's it's you know it's not like it's not like football when people think they're superstars. The runners are just so down to earth and just normal people, which I think is one of the great things about the sport. Yeah, I always see that in running as well. Um, like when I take my nephews to their football teams, you hear the venom coming from the side of the pitch from the parents, and it's <laughs> whereas. <laughs> and I've been in athletics since I was like 15 and I've not once came across any kind of that from any spectator, like never. It's always a positive environment, everyone's supportive. You know, if if you beat their athlete, you go, oh, well done. If you beat their kid, whatever, they go, oh, well done, that was a good run from you. It's not like, oh, we'll get you next time, I'm going to snap you. <laughs> it's, exactly, it's, exactly. It's yeah. good to hear that, that is like, it's not just in Scotland, it's, you know, worldwide, you know, any, any runner you meet, it's a, mutual respect exactly exactly yeah i totally agree with that it's a global sport and it's it's like that it's like that throughout the globe unless you unless you go into the the um the topic of uh performance enhancing drugs of course that kind of changes the playing field a little bit oh yeah yeah there's there's a lot there's a lot of that going about as well um well there was one individual but again like i said to you we were talking about Caleb in Indiku <laughs> uh, beforehand. You know, you're saying he yeah. he get done for drugs. Uh, people who don't know Caleb in Indiku, he's the he's the guy who won the Commonwealth Games in Glasgow in 2014. Uh, Zane Robertson, who's also been banned, he he came third that day. But Paul gave me a bit of uh, interesting fact about Caleb in Indiku. Um, he's 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 a wannabe rapper. So if you Type in Caleb and Deku into, into YouTube, you'll you find the Commonwealth Games champion rapping away. So, bit of interesting yep. info for you. Yeah, definitely there somewhere. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, that's so random. Commonwealth Games champion, I don't, I'm not interested in that. What about a rapper? <laughs> <laughs> uh, who cares? But, uh, but getting back to yourself, uh, so you're obviously Julie Nash, you get involved with the uh, Chili Mo. And it, yep. has there been any other, uh, from that, uh, did you get any other? Any other female athletes or male athletes who you began working with from Chilimo? Um, so from Joanne Chilimo's group, that I'd say that's the, the three athletes to keep looking out for. So Joanne Chilimo, she's we already know she's going to run Paris Olympics, so she's um she's going to run the marathon. She's got dual nationality with Romania, so oh. she's actually running for for Romania oh. in the Olympics, um, which is an interesting one. It's, I mean, she's got a a genuine, genuine chance to medal. Um, and you don't get a lot of Romanian athletes meddling and things like the marathon. So um, she's another interesting one to, to look out for. And then the the men's group um, is, a, is a super high standard in terms of marathons. Um, mostly Kenyans. They've got, they've got a whole bunch of like two or three marathoners. Um, possibly not household names but there's guys like Bethwell Yegon probably best known for being second to Kipchoge in Berlin two or three yeah. years um, and then there's there's Ronald Career, um, Alex Matisio so these guys are quite regulars on the podium um, races like Valencia etc across across Europe they're quite regularly hitting the podium so a super strong bunch of runners and then um, the, a French marathoner as well called Mehdi Freire he Ran two hundred five in Valencia there last year. So, um, again, you know, he's aiming for the, you know, obviously a home Olympics for him. He's he's hoping to give his best shot in Paris. So, yeah, super super strong group of of females and males, um, in in that group that that I'm currently working with. So it's it's really really exciting times. Amazing. I mean, if you had on 
uh, Phil Sessman mm. not long ago, and that he's yeah. you know, he ran yeah. the course in two weight. No, but like you're yeah. saying, there's yeah. Kenyan guys there. Always, obviously, Kipchoge is number one. You know, he's yeah. You yeah. get you've got an abundance of Kenyan guys who who smash that Olympic qualifying time of two o eight, and the Kenyan yeah. standard will probably be well, you need to run close to two o two, which is. <laughs> Quite a scary standard compared to the best British athlete just now. It's insane, Sean, isn't it? And it's things have moved on in the last few years just so much because, you know, in the grand scheme of things, like 208, it's a 208 low to qualify for the Olympics. And a, a few years ago, that was a, a pretty fast thing. Mm -hmm. But even it's, it's in the grand scheme of things, it's not, it's nowhere near now. When, you know, when guys have to run 203 to to win a marathon. It's just insane. Um, and they're only gonna get quicker. But there's you know, there's Europeans now, it's, it's not that long ago. So a guy called Sondre Moen, Norwegian, ran two oh five. Yeah. Which was a European record. And then I think Mo equaled it, didn't he? Mo or Mo, Mo went a few seconds quicker. And Chicago, yeah. Chicago, so like two oh five was a European record. Now now Europeans are running two oh five pretty regularly. Mm-hmm. It's just things have moved on so so quickly, and and in Kenya, yeah, they'll they'll, I mean, they run two hundred eight in a really hard course, mm -hmm. and in a flat course, they're all two hundred four, two hundred three, two hundred two. Yeah. So uh, it's just insane. And obviously, Kelvin Kipton, who we sadly lost um, in February, was the, the, the kind of the guy that was probably looking like he was going to break to in a an actual marathon. So, um, yeah, that's just a matter of time, that barrier as well. There's, there's going to be someone coming through soon and, you know, is it going to be a Kenyan, an Ethiopian or somebody else who's going to do that 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 sub two in a, in a marathon? It's going to be super exciting as well over the next few years. Yeah, because Kiptum, you could just, you could foresee it happening, but you couldn't foresee what was going to happen to him. Yeah. But, but yeah. I like, you no, know, because everyone just, because Kipchoge, you know, he's come through, you know, he was world champion when he was 18 at 5k so he's got that background of cross country and track all the way through but Kipton he just went from a young age he just went straight to the road and people were always asking oh why is how's he so quick it's because he was just he focused on one discipline which was the road and he was just and then he burst onto that scene he broke 202 and he was like wow that's and, and watched them run they just looked so powerful even from like they look 5k to go a marathon they just looked and like he looked so much more comfortable than Kipchoge did. <laughs> yeah, un unbelievable, unbelievable runner. And yeah, obviously these guys are super, super strong on the road. Um, you mentioned there about their age, being that young and Kipchoge being 18. There's, uh, there is a bit of kind of caution around their age because A, they don't have a, a kind of birth registration mm -hmm. certificate or process. So a lot of them probably don't really know when they were actually born or how old they really are. Mm -hmm. And then there's the fact that a lot of them run in juniors until they're about 25, 26. So <laughs> you can actually knock about five or six years off the age or, or, you know, we should be adding five or six years on to what they say they are. So when you've got all these Kenyans coming through running, you know, 205, 204, 203 and claiming that they're 20, 21, they're more like 26, 27, which kind of makes it difficult for for young guys growing up here in the UK. You know, you imagine 2021 year olds going, oh, but that Kenyan's running that fast in a marathon, so I should go into the marathon. And and it's yeah. just, it's it's kind of throwing things off a little bit. And we need to kind of be aware of that, that it's not it's not all as it as it seems um, in terms of the yeah. rating. Yeah, I suppose you probably get a lot of dates of birth that will be like the 1st of January. <laughs> <laughs> January, yeah, yeah. Like, everyone was born yeah. the 1st of January. Like, yeah, yeah. I suppose it is it would be hard to track you know back in the day you know, they didn't have the records that we do you know it was just you're born in a village on a farm <laughs> and then it was just like right that's it whereas we're you know we're given a birth certificate we're given a birthing number by a midwife a nurse <laughs> it's not yeah, like that but... that's it it's completely different over there completely different and then they're counting the age by like rainy seasons or Olympic cycles <laughs> <laughs> Like every four years, I, I add another year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's wild. <laughs> but um, what was going to ask you there was, so 
because you've had a lot of experience in Kenya as well. I've no, you've got the book uh, called the Red, uh, the Red Dust, which yeah, gone to, running on the Red Dust, yeah, running the Red Dust. So we're going to a wee sector too, but I, I watched that documentary before. I was with Kenyan runners. It was a uh, Eamon Coughlin. Oh yeah, and yeah. Uh, no, he was no. That his training methods also worked for him because he was five thousand meter world champion. You know, back in the day, um, yeah. he went to the same camp where David uh, Rhodesia yeah, trained yeah. in. The, and he was yeah. speaking to Brother Colm, etc. And yeah. he watched the the Brother Colm, the his athletes training, etc. And Eamon Coughlin was he was he could he was visibly quite shocked because back in his day, he was always taught, you know, if you don't spew at the end of a session, then you're not working hard enough. And he was like, it's the complete opposite in Kenya. It's their the their warm up is very, very long and then they'll maybe on a football pitch they'll Maybe jog like the jog like the sides, but then they'll they'll sprint up the up the diagonals and and then that's their session. And it's and brother Colm is like, oh no, it's more about development, development. It's not about breaking yourself down. And so is that what you've experienced as well in Kenya? It's it can be, it can be, yeah, yeah. Brother Colm's a good friend. I mean, I've, I've been lucky enough to spend quite a bit of time with him. Certainly in the the kind of earlier two or three years when I was going out there and. Um, you know, I've been along to some of his his sessions at the St Patrick's camp, as it's as it's called, it's a kind of private school, and they taken a lot of promising junior athletes. And um, but you know, when, when David Atisha was training, it was just it was incredible that you know you, you could be doing a, a say he's doing a set of two hundreds, and brother Colm will say, okay, I want you to do them in whatever twenty six seconds, and he, he doesn't really barely needs a watch. You just hit them all in twenty sec twenty six seconds every time, just. Incredible rep after rep after rep, and um, yeah, and, and also if they're going out on on an easy run, um, you know I've actually wrote in my book about going out on an easy run with with that group, and I was in Brother Colm's car with him at the time, and we're following the group of athletes, and and um, the shout is 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 mainly poly poly, which means in Swahili is just slow down, slow down. So it is, you know, and. In the easy runs, it's about mostly trying to trying to calm them down and just keep them relaxed and trotting along. Because if, if especially if it's a recovery run, you, you want it to do what it says in the tin. You want to recover from it, and 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 essentially stretch the spectrum if you like. So make the easy runs easier, so the the faster sessions are, are faster. Um, but there are obviously the hard sessions that are a real hard grind. Um and yes, yeah, it's, it's it's not it's not always about you know completely breaking yourself down and making you sick, but they 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 do do some some really difficult sessions as well as the very easy ones. But I think we say in the UK we train in that kind of middle zone too much, like the, the inverted U theory. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we we train in the middle zone, whereas the the inverted U should look more like a kind of tick, whereas we should be training much. Much less in the in the middle, and more to 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 either side, more easier and, and harder. If that kind of makes sense, and, and I think they've got that they've got that quite well measured in Kenya. Um, most of them have anyway. You still get you still get some that come back from maybe like an an eight k easy run, and they've done it in like three forty kilometers or something. And you're like, what? <laughs> Just depends on how they're feeling. I think at the time. And, yeah, I know it's. You can obviously you try to get drummed into people over here as well. You know, you no know, volume after you no know, the, the more the after training for a marathon. You know, you no know, volume is probably the most important thing, but it's important that you get your sessions right for the marathon as well. But then you see people, you know, oh, I just thought I'd do some speed work in the marathon. And you're like, you know, why, why are you doing ten four hundreds? Like that's like that's not marathon training, etc. It's it's still people still struggling to get away from that kind of Western. No culture of you know you need you really need to bury yourself you know and I've yeah I've very well, rarely seen that in kind of Kenyan athlete videos I've seen though they're always finishing reps looking really strong rather than really gasping yeah you you, you get a fair mixture to be honest you you do sometimes see them at the end of the session pretty much hands on knees they're pretty done yeah. you do get it but it's it's doing it at the right time so these sessions are important to to put them in but to take them out at this at, at the right time as well, and it's 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 all about. I I always say right exercise, right person, right time. Mm-hmm. 
you know, it's 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 always considering the the individual. And I think one of the interesting things in Kenya is that the training's not always that specific. Mm -hmm. So you will get athletes that can sometimes jump about from from group to group. And so essentially they're not doing any kind of specific training. They're just doing training. Mm -hmm. And they can still become really good athletes. So sometimes I think we can get a little bit bogged down in the nitty gritty and trying to refine things so much. Yeah. But we, we, we perhaps don't have to. Perhaps it's just about working hard at the right time and working easy at the right time. It's all about if, if we go back to the overload and recovery process, you know, you've got to have the right overload at the right time. You've got to recover adequately depending on the size of that overload. And that has to be specific enough to create the adaptations that you want to create. Mm -hmm. So I guess it's thinking about what outcomes that individual needs and, and the, yeah, and, and, and making it specific for that. Yeah. So it all comes back to the same science at the end of the day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think I think there are still a lot of people, especially in my hometown, who are guilty of not doing their easy runs easy enough. Um, yeah. Feels if they need to keep pushing it. Uh, <laughs> like, no, just slow down, slow down. But like you're saying though, um for the the Kenyan athletes that you are working with, you know, if they're doing their easy runs easier and if they're doing a lot more volume, that means they've got more to give in mm. in the harder sessions. So yeah. would they be able to give more basically and then to and then they wouldn't get to that kind of break point where they're when they are going working really anaerobically, is that kind of fair in saying that? Yeah, I think you probably are right in saying that. Um, I mean, the, the 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 Kenyans know how to work hard. Um, they, I think, from their upbringing, they are used to being uncomfortable, and we have this saying: "Get comfortable with being uncomfortable." Mm -hmm. They've got that nailed. Because see, when when we're training, when we become uncomfortable, that's when the Kenyans are just getting going, basically. Because <laughs> to them, like a lot of them have have grown up. And, and really poor conditions. They might be sleeping on the floor. They might not even have a mattress and stuff to sleep on. Mm -hmm. Probably, you know, clothes with holes in them, not well fed, etc. That's a kind of normal upbringing and it's tough. It's really, really tough. So when things get tough on a training session, that's that's almost like normal life to them. So they're okay with it. Whereas when, when things get hard for us, we're like, well, I don't, I don't really like this so much. I'm going to bail out. <laughs> You know, yeah. basically what, what I'm saying, Sean, is we're a bunch of softies. <laughs> <laughs> I can testify to that, yeah. <laughs> and the amount of sessions I've been like, oh, this is, this is tough going, I'll slow the pace down, etc. You know, but whereas, like you said, the Kenyans, they, they just they just do tough it out. They tough it out, they absolutely do. And then you see that, you see that even more in a race. Oh, yeah. You can just yeah, you can just see the way they the way they can grind out a race and, and sometimes push the pace from early and maintain it and push harder at the end. It's just incredible. And a lot of that I, I firmly believe is from the tough background. And I, that's what I was going to ask, one of my questions actually, because it, that is a thing, you know, the Kenyans, they always surge. You see them Olympics, they're always surging. Like is that trained by a coach or is that just there? Is that just a Kenyan way of racing? <laughs> <laughs> I mean they do a lot of fart like training sessions and the the far leg is hard you know it is hard um quite often it can be on an uphill on an uphill course um mm -hmm. unless they purposely want it to be really fast which they, they'll go and find a flat road there is a flat road that's commonly used you need to you need to drive about half an hour out of e 10 to find it um but quite often they use quite a hilly route in e 10 up uphill hard hard far leg and if it's if it's two minutes on, one minute off, for example, or something similar, um, the one minute off is not like a, a recovery minute like we might have it here. It's just slightly less slow than them going eyeballs out, you know. <laughs> so it's just it's crazy hard, and and I think that almost kind of gives them that that basis for their their surges when they do these races, and they know what they're doing. They know they're trying to make it a bit tougher, and and to to see who sticks with them and who drops off, and just make that lead that lead pack a little bit a little bit slower especially in championship races you know when when you've got a, a big front group of 20 to 30 and you've got no pacemakers it kind of needs a bit of surging to 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 get rid of some of the some of the athletes that shouldn't really be there and mm. yeah they, they, i guess they do kind of practice it in their fart leg sessions um in a way and that, that kind of gives them the basis to do that yeah and that's you've seen 
making it really tough on themselves the way down the fart leg. It, you know, one of the things I was going to ask is, you know, why is it, you know, you know, European males are uh, dominating the, the men's 1500 meters? You know, Josh Kerr, Jakob Ingebrigtsen, Jake Whiteman, and even at the Olympics, you know, you had um, the guy, oh, I forgot his name now, the Kenyan who was second to Jakob. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Cherry, Cherry. Yeah, yeah. Timothy Cherry, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. like yeah. he was like the last guy to really dominate. But in yeah. the past, there's always been a kind of low, a collection of Kenyans really going for it. But now they they kind of seem to have fallen off the fifteen hundred meters. Is that maybe is that a culture thing in Kenya? That maybe guys are going for the five, the ten instead. Exactly, exactly. I, I don't think it's a conscious choice. I think they just seem to be gravitating towards it. I don't know why, whether it's whether it's management or coaches that are pushing them into it, whether they just want to as an athlete, I'm not sure why. But you do tend to find that most most kind of athletes that you speak to talk about marathons. They, they seem to want to go for the marathon. And it, it may well be a Kipchoge influence. Yeah. Um yeah. who knows? But yeah, I'd, I'd say there's kind of less, you know, 800, 1500, even steeplechase. Yeah. There's, not, there's not that interest that the, there was in a big way even just five or six years ago. I think it's the the kind of marathon. It's almost like a fashion, isn't it, running marathons just now? It's almost like a kind of global fashion. <laughs> if anyone wants to like, do all the majors and blah, 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 what, what marathons are you doing this year? What marathons are you doing next year? People planning their lives around it. Maybe yeah. maybe that breaks Kenya. <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe. I mean, like you said, there is a big fashion about it. I mean, I'll give this boy a shout out, Oliver Riley from Glen Park Carriers. You know, he's on a mission just now. He's got one more marathon left, and that's him did all six yeah, uh, awesome. of the majors. And then that seems to be a kind of a trend now. You know, people want to go for uh, at marathons and stuff, you know. And yep. for me, like, you know, I'm happy just, I'm just not really getting any interest in traveling, you know, to New York and back and forth. And yep. I'm happy just getting my marathon thing faster. But yeah. And I think maybe the shoes as well. The shoes have maybe got people really into longer distances because, I, I, in my opinion, I think the shoes are better for longer distance. Um, I think over 5K and stuff, I prefer more of a kind of flat shoe. I don't know if you remember remember the Asics Piranha. It was, like, uh -huh. was like nothing. It was like a sand shoe. And right. my, my 5K and 3K PB in them. Uh, for me, but over the longer distance, I can definitely see the difference in using the super shoes. Yeah, and that's what they're designed for at the end of the day. It's, they're designed for efficiency, so conserving energy, therefore mm -hmm. making you stronger at the end of a longer race, such as a marathon. But I think they're also more, there's more benefit for elite athletes than, than what there is for sub-elite club runners, beginner runners, whatever. I think the, the more force you put into the ground, the mm -hmm. more you're going to get back from a carbon plate, basically, it's exact the same as a spring, isn't it? The more force you put through a spring, the more the more distance you're going to get from it. So, yeah, when, I mean, uh, it was Nike, wasn't it, talking about this four percent? Who knows what it actually is? But it's definitely definitely more for a top athlete than what it is for us. If if we get anything, but then at the end of the day, if it's if you believe it and you get that placebo effect, any any positive outcome that's that's going to improve your performance, then you take it definitely. Oh, yeah. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Like you're saying about that four percent. Um, no, it might have. Might, when they did the study and did the testing, they might have only been one person who got a four percent. <laughs> because I remember, because I've, I've studied sports science as well mm -hmm. back in college, and then uh, remember my lecturer telling me about he's like the whole culture about fat being bad for you. I think yeah. it was like one journalist found like one study out of like a million studies that's indicated that fat was bad for you. Then all of a sudden you've got all these food products that say fat free. So <laughs> Nike maybe have used the same thing, you know, this one guy got four percent, so let's just go with that and market it then. Yeah, and that, that that's controversial about nutrition, mate, but let's not, let's <laughs> not go down that road. We're talking yeah. about Nathan's diet next. Oh, so I know, I know. <laughs> but yeah, but I didn't read too much into it. I was just like, all right, that's a bit fat. I, I know you, you need you need everything, you need Carbs, fats, proteins, you need everything, you know. Yeah, yeah. But you you will get you will get people that go, Oh, I don't take on any fat. It's uh yeah. anyway. <laughs> No, you, you people need to realise you now that there's some point in a marathon if you run out of glycogen, you know, your, your body needs to <laughs> start using that fat. 
That's it. That's it. Yeah. But um, well, obviously, aren't you? Just one more bit in the super shoes. But for the the Kenyan athletes that you've seen in, in your squad, uh, do they do they feel a big difference using the shoes and at the elite level? Yeah, I'd say they, they definitely do. Um, you know, over, over the years I've been there. So currently, the group I work with just now is sponsored by um, Adidas or Adidas to pronounce it correctly. Um, and yeah, they I mean they love the, the Adidas racing shoes, obviously, and um, yeah, and they all the, the the Nike athletes love the Nike racing shoes, and the Asics athletes love the the Asics racing shoes, etc. Um, I've I've been lucky enough to be involved in like some. Some prototype testing as well with with both Nike and Asics, which is quite interesting. So you get to see what what's coming out next and what the 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 kind of engineers and technicians for the shoe companies are, are trying to do and all that kind of mm -hmm. stuff, which is which has been quite quite interesting over the years. But yeah, I mean, absolutely, the elite athletes can see the benefit from it, um, probably even more so than us. Um, mm -hmm. Interestingly, I think the biggest gain for for sub elite athletes, is just that the, the racing shoes are so much more comfortable these days. <laughs> yeah, it's a nicer shoe to wear, and you're less likely to get blisters and stuff from them, which is a big, big win. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, I noticed that even before the carbon shoes, remember the Adidas Adios, it was the, the Continental Tire Grip, yeah. the boosts. I remember <laughs> I bought them a day before the Tom Scott 10 miler. I was like, I'm gonna be covered in blisters, and I was like, oh, these have more structure to them, and I've not got any blisters. Whereas I wore first time I wore the piranhas, my feet were just on fire. <laughs> <It does. laughs> just I uh, tone to bits, more than when I tracked 10k and my feet were tone to bits. But yeah, like you're saying there though, with the with the shoes, it's, yeah, you you don't really get as many blisters often, but it's a lot more they're a lot more comfortable. Ah, it's like running in slippers. <laughs> yeah. yeah, one of the guys in my running club said that he's like, you just need to put them on and just and just let them do their thing. But they they really are. Comfortable, they really, really are. I wore them in the holiday, yeah, the four percent because they're pretty much done, just worn kicking about and yeah. stuff. And down the beach, like, and that, <laughs> yeah, yeah, just really nice on you on your feet. Uh, good, why not? Eh? Absolutely, but yeah, so and more about yourself and less about super shoes. So, you've wrote a book <laughs> called Running uh, the Red Dust, so a book about athletes in Kenya. So, tell us <laughs> a bit about that. It was pretty random to be honest, Sean. I wrote it in lockdown, nice. And um, and I, I'd never really thought about it. I think, I guess I was just bored one day. <laughs> Probably as everyone was locked on their yeah. houses for that long. And I just had all this kind of stuff on my laptop and in various different forms. And I just started putting it all together. And then it's, I, I realised that it kind of started forming like chapters and stuff. And then I just continued with that. And and it kind of put it into a, put it into a book and it's quite an easy read you know it's not it's not a massively in depth it's like 70 odd pages so you know you can you can get through it on your flight to Spain for holidays you know it's, not, it's I kind of I wrote it a bit like a a documentary that's what I had in mind I love watching documentaries especially running documentaries and that's what I had in my head at the time that I was writing the book I tried to kind of write it in a way that was um, edutainment, if you like, so you know, educational entertainment, um, and it, it it kind of just follows the pathway of the the poverty that the Kenyan athletes grow up in, and um, how they start training and different training methods, different training sessions, um, a bit about their food, just a general life, um, uh, and yeah, it, it just kind of formed this wee book, so. Yeah, running the red dust. The name, the name kind of comes from the the Kenyan ground. Um, you've seen the pictures. It's all all the roads are very very red, and the they're all they're all dust tracks, if you like, that that people run on. And uh, when you're running in a group, there's kind of dust flying about everywhere. And obviously, the the faster you run, the more dusty it is. <laughs> <laughs> so if you if you finish a run and you're kind of covered in dust. You know you've had a really good hard run, so like yeah. you, you kind of laugh at the guys that end up with red teeth because all the red dust stuck to their teeth, and that's when you know you've had a really you know you've had a really good hard run if you get red teeth at the end of it. <laughs> you're you're kind of easy runs, you don't really get much of that. So it's how much you go on a hard run, you see how much dust can I get on me, basically. <laughs> that's, I need to, I need to, I've I've got it on my list. 
I've got it in my, in my Amazon bucket, so I ah, need, cool. need to get that, get it in time for holding, give it a read. I'll, I'll do a wee review of it in one of the episodes as well. That's it. It's good, good airplane reading. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's great to you know, talk to someone who's, you know, especially someone from Scotland who's, who's been, who's been there and, you know, experienced that running lifestyle in Kenya as well. And, and you've got, you're currently working with, you know, probably like you said, I'll, I'll, I'll see a quote right now from the Sweat Lake video. Um, you're working, in your opinion, probably the greatest Olympic, potentially the greatest Olympic athlete since Usain Bolt. Yeah. I did quote that. I stuck my neck in the line for that, didn't I? It's a big, a big claim to make. But I, I see so much potential in Agnes. She's, she's a phenomenal athlete. Like some of the sessions I've seen her do, she can, if things go according to plan, because you know winning gold medals at Olympics is super challenging. Being the best on the planet is super, super challenging, and repeating that in four year cycles or every two years if it's world champs is such a challenge. To do and obviously you saying Bolt, I think he got eight. Did he get eight Olympic golds? Obviously he's he's a sprinter. He's got hundred meters, two hundred meters plus relays. Um, it's going to be slightly harder for Agnes. I, you know, I'm not saying she'll get eight Olympic gold medals. That'd be ridiculous. But I see, I see the potential for her to go gold medal after gold medal in Olympics and World Champs. Yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. It's like. like... I said, then you know, you're saying, well, it's 100, 200 in the relay, and yeah. they're, they're short, sharp, and fast. Um, not saying they're easy to recover from because you get your rounds, etc., as well. But you know, the 10,000 is always the first event. So if Agnes, like, here's hoping she gets a, a race where it is slow and tactical, and then she's able to run away. But if other girls go like that, okay, we're going to try and make her work really hard to her, and they run a, and they run a time very close to world records, then that hinders slightly hinders her recovery for the five thousand where she still needs to qualify for the final. So yeah. it is in a way it, it's a wee bit more challenging. I'm just being biased because I'm a I'm a distance runner myself. So <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, you're totally right. You're totally right. And I, I should say at this at this point as well. So Agnes she normally has the name Ingetich on her bib. So Kenyans quite often have two names, a tribal name um, and a family name, but when she races, she normally has Ingetich. So if people are looking out for her, that's that's what to look out for in her bib. Excellent. They definitely will. The Scottish Running Pack podcast will be supporting Agnes and all the Scottish athletes at the Olympics, but because Agnes has kept it to herself, we'll be cheering her on in, in the 10,000. <laughs> 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 but, um, but yeah, on to yourself again. And so you've been working locally as well. Uh, not just yep. in Kenya, but you've been working with the Spring Springfield Harriers, West End Roadrunners, and also the Bella Harriers as well. And uh, yep. I had a look on your website, the the and you've been bringing you know, the the Kenyan methods to these running clubs as well. So uh, chat us a, a wee bit about that then. Yeah, I mean the the kind of running club stuff here has been going great. I think I think we're really lucky in Scotland with our club set up. Um, and I, you know, I think Scottish Athletics have, have done a great job recently as well with with keeping it all together. And in recent years, and things have been challenging. And um, I, I've been lucky to to be involved in it as well. I think. I mean, I've, I've been coaching for a number of years since I was like sixteen, seventeen. I got into sports coaching. Um, but the, the kind of running has really developed over the last kind of eight eight or nine years. And um, I got involved with West End Roadrunners since their their early days. So it's it's only eight years old. The club and. We're up, we're up at about 200 members, so it's been an incredible success. And a lot of that is down to how well the club has run. So so um, Graham Jack, who's is also involved with Athletics Trust Scotland, uh, the, the Scottish Athletics Trust, um, which is part of Scottish Athletics. Um, he does a great job in, in running West End Roadrunners with, with his team there. Um, so that's that's been fantastic. Um, and then with Bellhus and Harris, also, like you said, that's the club that I run for. Um and yeah, lucky enough to coach there as well, and it's going great guns. We're up at nearly two hundred members there as well, so um can't really can't really have any complaints. And then I started with um Springburn Harriers um last year, and there's a lot of people at Springburn doing great work as well, trying to um drive forward Springburn and really getting it back back to where it was um in its glory days because it, it kind of quietened down quite a bit in recent years, and it's it's turning round and it's getting busier again and so hopefully we'll start to see a lot more Springburn vests on start lines of races now as well for, for juniors and, and seniors. The juniors are going really, really well. So 
Yeah, and in, in, in Glasgow, I think the, the club seems great, and I'm I'm very lucky to be involved with with the really really good clubs. Um, and yeah, in in, in terms of kind of um, bringing the kind of Kenyan methods, I think again I've I've been so lucky with with what I've been involved in in Kenya. I've worked with so many great coaches, like you mentioned, brother Colum earlier on, and Renato Canova is a kind of big name, famous Italian coach, marathon coach. He's just f got phenomenal stories, man. He's so good to sit and listen to. Yeah. And, um, yeah, the, the kind of Kenyan coaches are interesting. And then there's there's a lot of, obviously, European coaches out there. So um, you, you pick up things from everyone across the globe. And obviously Patrick Sang as well, who's who's got some some kind of great coaching methods. He's known as the professor. So if anyone's not sure about Patrick Sang, he's the current coach to um, Elliot Kipchoge and that group, as well as some, some other athletes. Um, I think Athing Moo, the 800 metre champion, is also coached by him. So, um, yeah, and then they've all got some great methods, some great sessions. Um, some great experience and history behind them and, and yeah I just feel so privileged and lucky to have been able to spend time with them and bring a lot of that knowledge um, back to Scotland and, and utilise it utilise it here yeah yeah and that's and like you said what a great addition to like you said the Scottish club uh, structure yeah as well like, what a great addition to that if you can you know, bring that across you know the Kenyan methods from these world class coaches as well. It's yep. that's only going to help develop, you know, future Scottish stars. You know, it is, and a, a lot of a lot of the, the the coaches in Scotland as well will, will know me because I I tutor a lot of the coaching courses um, and assess a lot of the coaches, um, which again I'm I'm super lucky and grateful for. It's one of the best jobs I feel for somebody like myself that I can do, and um, I feel privileged that I can pass on a lot of knowledge onto the the future of. Um, Scottish athletics running coaches, mm -hmm. um, essentially, um, which yes, yeah, a great thing to do, and, and I think we're there's a number of us really trying to raise the standards of of coaching in Scotland, um, which I think to, to a certain degree is needed. To, you know, I I would say like through the kind of COVID lockdown, we went through a spell where um, everybody's every personal trainer out there thinks they're a running coach and just <laughs> every just you know, and, and so many runners and athletes think they're a running coach and a lot of them don't don't have a qualification or anything to they don't have a coaching license um and it's it's a it's just a bugbear of mine i think we need to get these people on coaching courses and get them licensed and give them the knowledge yeah and rather than have them out there just thinking that they're doing the right thing and killing athletes or kill, killing runners <laughs> we want to be getting more people off the couch and, and get them running more regularly and it's that it's, it's numbers that creates competition and competition creates results and that's that's the kind of avenue that I think that's where we've been so successful in recent years and then you throw in the role models that we've had in recent years um, you know the, the boot charts the McCoggins the Muse etc and um, and that kind of creates that recipe for success and um, I really, really pleased again to 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 kind of be part of that. Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. You know, during COVID, I think everyone, which was great, people got outside and started kind of challenging themselves. I'm going to try and do a five k, ten k, etc. Yeah. But I had <laughs> at least two personal local where I'm from. Personal trainers messaged me and asked me for sessions. And I'm just like, well, you're more qualified than me. Like I've. I've got experience with sessions, but most of the time I just do what, you know, whatever my coach told me. If it's Craig Ruddy, Chris Mackay or Mark Pollard, you know, I'll just do what they, what they tell me to do. Yeah. But there was a couple of PTs who, you know, reached out to local runners and one of them was like, oh, I've got this guy, he's he's doing the marathon in like six months' time. Like, um, I'm, I'm going to give him these sessions. Um, I think that's a good idea. I was like, well, what's his target? Oh, he, like, oh, he just wants to finish. Yeah, like, exactly. Like, no, I just, just run. Like, just, <laughs> yeah. just, just run volume. Like, he just, he needs to, more. just needs to experience fatigue. Like, <laughs> over a long time. That's and they're like, all oh, right, and they were giving him stuff like interval training and all sorts. I'm like, 
if you want to finish a marathon, mate. But I know, like, that they this was the qualified, you know, PTs. You no, know, that you'd think they would have researched a bit instead yeah. of coming yeah. to a guy yeah. who they know has ran a marathon. I'm like, <laughs> I got it for some else. It doesn't mean it's going to work for your guy who wants to finish a marathon. <laughs> yeah, you've totally hit the nail on the head. That's exactly it. <laughs> but like you said, though, if we can get, if we can educate people, you know, get them under you know, the Scottish Athletics coaching, here's the principles, etc. here's how to do it safely, then that's only going to advance people's coaching and then that would advance junior athletes and other athletes as well. Exactly, exactly. And that's why we have a licensing system at the end of the day, it's to, to get people properly qualified, educated. And then there's additional bits as well, there's safeguarding, there's first aid, etc. We, we need to make sure these people are safe at the end of the day. Yeah, exactly. That's when the, the committee for our club as well, there's always... We always go through safeguarding, like any safeguarding, etc. Every club needs to go through it, you know, and make sure we're all up to date, etc. As well. Yeah. And, you know, but that is that is amazing that you are that your experiences out in Kenya and the experience you've gained, the qualifications you've got, um, even before you went to Kenya, you know, qualified sports scientist, etc. As well, and strength and conditioning coach. Uh, I think it's amazing, you know, and yeah, I think you're probably one of the most, you know, you're a really very very experienced coach, um. Like, and you're bringing that back to, you know, Springburn Harriers, Bella, West End Road Runners. You might, you might even get more clubs contacting you after this podcast. You never know. I might, I might, uh, yeah. <laughs> you never know. I don't know if I have time, but we'll, we'll see what happens. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But um, but one last thing as well, you know, uh, you are a club runner as well, and you've your best time for the marathon two thirty three and a thirty two minute ten k as well. That's quite quick. Yeah, I, I, I ran 232 in Loch Ness a few years ago, but I'm not sure if it's on Power of 10. You probably Power of 10 me. Uh, yeah. <laughs> my 233 was London last year. That's probably the one that you've picked up on. Yes, uh, that was the that was the one. Yeah, and 30, 32.38 for my 10K, mm-hmm. which was, yeah, I mean, I was 40 years old at the time, so it's not bad. <laughs> oh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, 40 years old, so we've got a guy in our club just now, Mark Doherty. <laughs> um, Mark's a phenomenal runner, eh? Yeah, I mean, I, I knew, I always knew he had a bit of ability, but it took a bit of time away from the sport. Uh-huh. And then he came back, you know, 30, you know, a low 30, 10k, sub 15, 5k, and, you know, um, I think he's British Masters, cross country champ, you know, that. It was, yeah, yeah. Insane, insane ability. And he, he was 40, you know. Yeah. And it's it's crazy because people write people off once they're in their thirties these days. Especially yeah. <laughs> in other sports, like oh he's thirty three, he's past it, and all this kind of stuff. You're like what? It, people can quite easily peak in their forties. Yeah, you can, you can beat your fittest in your forties. Absolutely no doubt, and your fastest in your forties. Absolutely no doubt at all. Um, and again, going going back to Kenya, like a lot of the Kenyan athletes, like I was saying earlier, they're older than they actually publicise their age to be. And uh, yeah, definitely a lot of them in their forties when they're on super fast times and peak in the marathon, especially. So yeah. that's hope for it all. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. You're talking about age and stuff as well. You know, reading the other day there. I mean, the country it was. I, I don't think it was Swiss because that like, Julian Vanders, is, <laughs> he runs for Switzerland. But there was a runner. I think he ran two o five, and he's forty two years old. I don't know what country it was. Yeah, it's um, Abraham Tedesi, so I know him, yeah, I know Julian and Abraham quite well. Yeah, I can't remember what country it was, but oh, 42 years old. 205, he ran 205 just a few weeks ago. Yeah, and that's, and people, I think that again, I think it goes back to that football culture, there's that football mentality for all sports, and in the UK especially, it's like, as soon as you hit 30, actually, no, you can't do that, it's like, yeah. but it's you look crazy. at the it's wild. You look at the Olympic champions, the marathon, there was that Portuguese guy, Silva, he was 37, 38. You know, Kipchoge in his late 30s. So mid 40s, mid 40s. I keep trying. <laughs> yeah, yeah, go for that. I know. If, I mean, if that is true, that, you know, Kipchoge is actually mid 40s and he's running sub two, that's insane. Phenomenal. <laughs> it's, it's incredible. But, uh, but no, it's, this has been amazing talking to you, Colin. It's been great to hear about your experiences in Kenya and especially, you know, working with uh, Agnes Jubek, you know, the greatest 10K of all uh, women's runner of all time and 
I can only see more things to come from her as well. And it's exciting to see that, that you're part of that team as well. So it's, it's a super exciting year and I'm hoping to be back out in Kenya prior to the Olympics, the pre-Olympic block. Um, so with the Kenyan trials, I kind of mid-June. So possibly end of June, July, some point may well be back in Kenya doing some training with some of them. And hopefully we'll get a number of them um, out in Paris and Paris Olympics and see how they get on, fingers crossed. But yeah, I've really enjoyed the chat, Sean, to be honest. I, yeah, I love, love talking, running stuff and sport and fitness and health and all that kind of stuff. Definitely really enjoyed it. Probably. It's great. It's, there's nothing that we were they had on, though you've heard, you probably have heard of him, Dr. Tin Man Schwartz. Uh, the coach for America, they had him on. Yeah, and he was I just so much about him. Yeah, he's lovely, lovely guy. You no, know, very, yeah. you know, very well experienced coach in America, and you know he was you know, the whole time. Me and Pete were just sitting here, and he was just get on talking to us. He was just, I, was like, I just love chatting to talk about athletics, and he <laughs> yeah. was really, and he was really kind of jealous of like the the UK running scene. He's like, they've not got that in America, whereas the UK have got it spot on yeah a lot of the other nationalities say that about what we've got in the UK we've got a really good setup and yeah other, other nationalities they don't have the kind of club scene that we have I mean obviously in America they've got the college system which yeah. is massive and yeah just crazy hard and a lot of folk go out there from Scotland as well and it's kind of it'll either make you or break you <laughs> <laughs> it looks like it made Josh care anyway so it certainly does it certainly yeah. does <laughs> But no, it's been absolutely amazing speaking to you and I really, really hope all of our listeners take you know, a lot of advice from this as well and and, and always look out for it. What was uh, Agnes Chibet's, what's her bib number again? Yeah, she has Ingetich. Ingetich. Yeah, that's, that's the name she normally uses when she's running. Absolutely. Look out for her. Joanne Chilimo as well will be at the Olympics and um, look out for Diana when, she's, when she goes into the senior ranks as well. So... Um, yeah, I'm, I'm really, really pleased to have been on. Sean, thanks for thanks for inviting me. I've really enjoyed the chat and been able to talk about some of these athletes and that are, that are doing phenomenal things and and uh, long may it continue. And hopefully the sport of running just keeps growing. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> well, thank you again for coming on. Cheers, mate.